drive north from Cardiff on the A470 and you will most likely notice this tower. There used to be six that supported the Walnut Viaduct, a monument to Victorian engineering and apparently what a million bricks look like piled up, which I can't quite believe, but my source is Wales Online. It's 100 feet tall and in 1977 had official graffiti of the Queen's Silver Jubilee, making it a royal memorial. In 2019, during October, probably the 21st, someone had a banner made and pinned high up. A story in itself on how that was planned and executed, but this piece of very Welsh graffiti joins as many as a hundred other examples scattered across the country. Some crude and some polite. The graffiti first appeared nearly 60 years ago on a gable of a derelict cottage on the A487, 10 miles south of Aberystwyth, created by the Welsh journalist and scholar Mike Stevens as a protest against the upcoming flooding of the Dwaran Valley to make a reservoir for Liverpool. But more on that later. As it happened, he spelt Dwaran with an anglicised T, so in a strange bit of graffiti pedantry, it was later corrected, and it stayed there, a quiet reminder of English hegemony over Wales. It's been restored over the years and vandalised in the last decade, most notably being the Elvis paint job in 2019. And on restoration, the wall was subsequently partly demolished in an act of anti-Welsh vandalism. And then it all kicked off, and the words now a slogan painted on walls across the nation, and carried on flags by the growing independence movement, Yes Can Re. As the actress-singer Karen S. Ellery satirically points out, the act of vandalism introduced the current generation to Wales's past struggles. So why remember Drawaran? Wales is blessed with both deep valleys and rain. The Victorians built reservoirs and dams such as Elan Valley for Birmingham and Vernwy for Liverpool, which displaced the community. Cities need water and Wales has it. As a society, we accept the needs of the many outweigh those of the few, hence we have compulsory purchase orders so we can build power infrastructure, roads and railways our civilization needs. But the damming of the Drawaran was English hegemony over the Welsh. Back in the 1950s, Liverpool City imagined it would grow in population and industry and needed more water, and it chose the Drewaran Valley just north of Bala. The reservoir displays the community of Capelkelen, around 70 people. This is Pathé's newsreel from 1965. The tiny village of Capelkelen in North Wales nears the end of its centuries of history, for in a few months' time the waters will be rising above its rooftops. Parliament has approved a plan by Liverpool Corporation to dam the Trewerin Valley and create a new city reservoir. The 70 inhabitants of the valley, supported by Welsh opinion generally, have been fighting the plan. They want to stay on the land where their ancestors have lived, worked and worshipped for generations. Liverpool, they point out, already has a reservoir at Lake Vernwy, not far away, and will soon have so large a surplus you'll be able to sell water to other English towns. Men like farmer R. E. Jones, who's reared 13 children in Trewerin Valley, still do not know whether their compensation will be in money or land. If we must leave the valley of our fathers, they ask, let us at least know what our future is to be. Now compare with Pathé's news reel of the plight of a similar village in France. Progress spells death to the little village of Tien, high up in the French Alps. From their ancient homes, the 430 inhabitants have been ordered to move, and they protest. For countless generations, their families have lived here. Now their valley is to be flooded to provide, through a huge dam, power for France. The sons of Tien served France. Now France claims their homes as well. Life here was never rich nor easy, but a man could afford his glass of wine. Well, here goes the last. Even the dead must move. These two have been found a new resting place to which they will be taken before the waters flood in. Did you notice the difference in tone? The difference in music? The attitude seems to project the Welsh community as passive sheep and the French mountain folk as far more assertive goats. Liverpool Council were able to bypass the Welsh by going directly to Parliament. Its 650 MPs, naturally dominated by England's greater population, voted the bill through 
with 35 Welsh MPs against. On July 31st, 1957, Parliament passed the Trowar and Reservoir Bill. The villagers did petition the City Council, demonstrating outside City Hall, children and old alike, but were met with hostility rather than sympathy by the city. In 1965, the dam was complete and the home flooded. As you can see by the elaborate weirs and straining of the river at Bala, this reservoir did not pipe water directly to Liverpool, but controlled the flow of the river to be extracted further downstream. And the irony is that Liverpool, both in population and industry, was in decline in the 60s. It never needed the water anyway. Just 20 miles away from the reservoir to the northeast, 600 years ago, a property dispute between an English lord and a Welsh prince, where King Henry favoured the English lord, escalated into a full-blown war of independence by Wales against the English. That lasted over a decade, and despite failure, the rebellion led by Armand Blair did foster a national identity that has survived despite the odds to this day. A greedy land grab by an English lord awoke a dragon. And I'm not being hyperbolic when I think the flooding of the Druaran has greater repercussions. Wales saw its first act of modern terrorism during the construction phase. The anger of Welsh nationalists seems to have been centred on this new £20 million dam at Trewerin in North Wales. Ever since Liverpool Corporation announced in 1955 that they were going to build a dam here to form a reservoir to provide water for their city, there have been letters to the papers, petitions, protests and national conferences to protest about the flooding of this part of Wales. But then in September of last year, these protests took a new turn. There had been rumours for some time of a new militant movement, an organisation that might take more direct action, perhaps on the lines of the IRA in Ireland. When three men, with student Emer Lou Allen, farmer's son Owen Williams, and former RAF military policeman John Albert Jones, formed the MAC, the Movement for the Defence of Wales. Hardly the Red Army faction, they used a five-pound bomb to blow up a transformer at the works, and later a similar device at an electricity pylon near the nuclear power plant at Treveniot. All were quickly caught and given sentences that ranged from three years on probation to 12 months prison sentences. The story retold in the award-winning documentary The Welshman, out in 2021. Although it's not the first time direct action had been taken in Wales in the 20th century. In 1936, three Ply Cymru members, a dramatist, a poet and a novelist, set fire to the RAF bombing school on the Thlin Peninsula and then went to give themselves up at Pofali police station. De Warren demonstrated that Wales had little power in the Union and there was a growing sense of injustice and as a result, Ply Cymru leader Winfor Evans was elected to Parliament in 1966 first for the party, although there may have been more to do with the failings of the Labour MP. The Welsh language was finally recognised in a limited way in 1967, and fully recognised and equal to English in 1993. And it should be noted that the people of Capel Kellen were a Welsh-speaking community, with English being a second language. It was a time when multiculturalism was not a thing in Britain. And the sense that Wales has not served well in its junior membership of the Union is growing. One of the main antagonisms with the scheme, on a local level, was the lack of choice given to the residents, and the unsympathetic approach of Liverpool City Council. Even Alderman DJ Lewis, a member of the Liverpool City Council at the time, stated in 1956 that the scheme should have been handled more tactfully, suggesting if they had gone to representative Welsh bodies, perhaps with the help of the Minister for Wales, there might have been a different outcome. Now, I have one last question. How did they get that banner up a 100-foot tower? Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hit the like, subscribe, and consider being a producer through Patreon.